Mahatma Gandhi once said that an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. I agree with this learned quotation about conflict and hope to explore this subject a little more deeply with you in the next half hour or so. This is a narrated PowerPoint screencast in furtherance of your understanding of Chapter 9, Conflict and in Interpersonal Communication, in our textbook, Communication Competence, Creating Satisfying Interpersonal Relationships. My name is Dr. Jason Stone, and I'm a communication professor and the author of this textbook. Let's explore conflict and interpersonal communication in a little bit more rich detail. Here's a roadmap about where we're headed so you can follow along. First, we'll define conflict. Next, we'll discuss principles of conflict and some causes of conflict. Then we'll look at different outcomes of conflict, some potential responses that people use when they're engaged in conflict, and then finally, ways that we can resolve conflict. Our text in chapter nine defines conflict as occurring in interactions where there are real or perceived incompatible goals, scarce resources, or opposing viewpoints. Interpersonal conflict may be expressed verbally or non-verbally along a continuum ranging from nearly imperceptible cold shoulder to a very obvious blowout. Another definition taken from a different textbook authored by Wilmot and Hawker in 2006 defines interpersonal conflict as existing when there is expressed tension between people who are interdependent, perceive that they have incompatible goals, and feel a need to resolve their differences. The primary components of the definition are expressed tension, interdependence, perceived incompatible goals, and the felt need for resolution. If there is no felt need for resolution, then the conflict just continues on a low simmer. Bolstered by two solid definitions of conflict, let's explore some principles of conflict in interpersonal communication. First is that conflict is natural in relationships. You are not going to agree with other people with whom you are engaged in relationships with 100% of the time. Hence, conflict will be inevitable and it will be natural in your relationships. Next, conflict may be expressed overtly or covertly. Some people express conflict very directly. They'll look you right in the eye and tell you that they disagree with you or that they think that you are wrong. And uh, they will tell you exactly what they plan to do uh, to engage in that overt conflict with you. Uh, they'll, they'll call their shots. They're gonna say, I'm gonna engage in you know, this conversation. I'm gonna go talk to this person and I'm gonna leverage these resources uh, to win this conflict. Uh, other people are much more covert about it. Uh, they may never even tell you uh, that they disagree with something that you've said or something that you've done. They may never, may never demand any accountability from you. And indeed, you may find uh, that they are uh, engaged in all sorts of conflict to deny you resources, to undermine you, to smear uh, your name, uh, because they are engaged in covert conflict. The third one there, social groups share meaning uh, of conflict behaviors. Uh, so uh, if I, I have a, a vigorous disagreement uh, with, a with a fellow faculty member on a committee, uh, about the importance of workforce training versus general education, um, that conflict will be put into context by our shared social group. Uh, some faculty members uh, may uh, see the conflict the same way. If there's some staff members who are on that committee, they might perceive it completely differently. Conversely, uh, if two football coaches uh, who are on uh, the same team uh, get into a, a pretty vigorous conflict with one another, that conflict uh, specific to that social group will, will have a specific meaning. And how that conflict is expressed will be specific to that social group. Conversely, two professors uh, engaged in a conflict is probably gonna look, too, is gonna, is gonna look a little bit different than two uh, high school football coaches uh, engaged uh, in a conflict. And all of that might look uh, remarkably different uh, than two sorority sisters uh, who are engaged in conflict. Next, conflict can be managed well or poorly. For the most part, most of you have probably managed conflict pretty poorly uh, up to this point. Hopefully you'll get some tools uh, for how to better manage it in this narrated PowerPoint and in your lessons uh, related to this chapter. Finally, the last bullet on this slide, conflict can be good for individuals and relationships. Sometimes we put off conflict, but after we have it, 
uh, some things uh, are said that needed to be said, uh, the air is cleared, and people are more able to engage uh, in productive relationships because they've cleared the air and because they've resolved their conflict. I thought this next slide was really interesting. Uh, there's a lot of facts uh, about uh, conflict. The methodology is uh, that John Wiley and Sons uh, conducted a workplace conflict survey. In that survey, they asked 12,000 business people, ranging from executives to managers to individual contributors about their experience with conflict in today's workplace. Overwhelmingly, uh, the words associated with conflict, 90% uh, of the responses were negative. Um, the, the general sentiment uh, around workplace uh, conflict is that it tends to be uh, bad for business. Uh, it's full of drama, petty, it's gossip, it's fight, it's arguments, it's bullying, ego and frustration uh, are some of the words included in the word cloud there. Uh, in the second panel, in the middle panel, uh, we see that 70% of manager level employees or above said that conflict negatively impacts their organization's efficiency. And those same managers said that they spend approximately 3.2 hours out of their 40 hour work week dealing with conflict and trying to manage conflict uh, among um, manager level respondents. Finally, there in the third uh, panel, uh, conflict fuels employee turnover. 40% of people said that they have left a job in the past because of unhealthy conflicts. 69% said that their job satisfaction would improve if their coworkers handled conflict more efficiently. So we see potentially hundreds of thousands, if not millions, uh, if not hundreds of millions of dollars uh, potentially lost uh, to U.S. organizations uh, because of conflict. Um, you take that 3.2 hours a week and uh, figure out what somebody's hourly rate of pay is, and that is how much conflict is impacting that particular position uh, each and every week. And that's how we, we figure out return on investment. So if we're spending 3.2 hours a week engaged in managing conflict or resolving conflict or attempting to de-escalate conflict, if we could arrive at a point where we were spending maybe one hour a week uh, engaged in conflict or managing conflict, that would be a 2.2 hour of productivity increase raise. And uh, you can you know, pretty easily figure out the return on investment just by figuring out how much everybody makes per hour and uh, how much time you've actually saved the organization in terms of decreasing the overall amount of time spent managing conflict. We've defined conflict. We looked at some of the impacts of conflict. We uh, discussed some of the costs associated with conflict and in particular with bad conflict. Now let's talk about some of the causes of conflict. And uh, these are adapted uh, from uh, some information that, that was provided by Christopher Moore uh, in a textbook called The Mediation Process. And uh, let's look first at some different sources of conflict. And I wanna start here with, uh, with data in the top right. Uh, when people lack data, when people have misinformation, when people don't have all the data that they need uh, to make a decision or to have an informed choice, sometimes they speculate. And in the absence of data, um, frequently employees and organizational members speculate. When they don't have data, there tends to be more conflict. When people perceive that there is data that they should have that's being kept from them, that fuels conflict. The next form of conflict is interest. And uh, both of the definitions talked kind of about perceived or actual conflicts of interest. Uh, those perceived or actual conflicts of interest can also take uh, the form of procedural or psychological interests. And uh, people just have a lot of agendas. When they're pushing those agendas, they're typically pushing for their interests. Uh, people's vital self-interests uh, are sometimes at odds. And uh, that's a situation where if there's not a whole lot of resources, then you know potentially there's going to be uh, a lot of conflict. Next is value. We have different ideologies. We have different worldviews. Uh, maybe somebody uh, really favors, uh, you know, independence uh, for, for their uh, employees and flexibility. And maybe somebody else is really rigid and uh, they want everything done, you know, a really specific way. Uh, if both of those, you know, two managers have those remarkably different worldviews, they're going to construct two subsets of that organization that are, are remarkably different in terms of their value propositions. Next is structural. Uh, if people have unequal authority or unequal control of resources or unequal time, um, then typically that is a, a pretty potent source of, of conflict. Uh, in particular, if all of those people are at the same areas, if uh, one employee 
finds that they're having to spend a ton of time every week doing a, a mundane task and uh, the other uh, employee uh, has somebody else who does that for them, uh, then that's going to uh, create tension uh, between those two people. Uh, when one of the employee looks at the situation and says, it's not right that I have to work this much harder to accomplish the same thing. Finally, uh, the fifth uh, potential source of conflict is relational. Uh, and under that, we have four uh, sources. We have miscommunication, strong emotions, stereotyping, and repetitive negative behavior. And uh, as relationships become frayed and uh, people stop kind of putting uh, conflict on the back burner uh, in favor of the relationship, we call this the loyalty response to conflict. As relationships fray and as these uh, different, you know, sources of conflict build up, we tend to get a less elegant discharge of conflict and people minimize that loyalty response. Loyalty response is where you say, well, I'm more loyal to this relationship than I am uh, to uh, whatever this is that's, that's irritating me. And uh, I'm not going to make waves. Uh, I'm going to instead value relate the relationship and value organizational peace and uh, engage in the loyalty response. Uh, when relationships start to break down, uh, the loyalty response uh, also starts to break down. And there's our roadmap. Again, you see that we've covered definitions, principles, impacts, and causes. And uh, we're about halfway done uh, with our video. Finally, we just need to cover outcomes, responses, and conflict resolution. These three potential outcomes to conflict are important uh, to remember. Uh, you'll certainly see them on uh, your quizzes and on your tests. And uh, as I like to tell uh, my in-person students, this information will be on the test. It will be on the test every day for the rest of your life. You have win-win conflict. Uh, that's where both uh, sides, both parties to a conflict get a part of what they want. In win-win scenarios, both negotiators end out ahead. Uh, and then you have win-lose. And uh, we see that in the middle panel. We see one person uh, wearing a birthday hat and they're celebrating. And we have one person who's got a cloud over the head and that's because they're sad. In win-lose negotiation outcomes, one party wins and the other party loses. And then finally we have lose-lose. And in lose-lose outcomes, both parties wind up worse off. Um, sometimes this can happen when one party perceives that they are going to lose in the conflict and that uh, they will be uh, the big loser uh, in the conflict. So they attempt to wound the other person uh, so that it will be a lose-lose conflict for both of them. Next, I'd like to talk to you about this chart uh, that has a couple of different axes. Uh, we see on the horizontal axis, that's low openness uh, of community. I'm sorry, yes, on the vertical axis, we see low openness of communication and high openness of communication. Uh, on the horizontal axis, we see low consideration of others and then a high consideration of others. Let's begin in the top right uh, there at one o'clock. We see at the top right in the yellow panel, we have assertive. And that is a orientation towards conflict that is high in its openness of communication and high in its consideration of others. Assertive communication uses a lot of I statements and doesn't use a lot of you statements. Assertive communication states what the I uh, will put up with and what the I will accept. And uh, assertive communication frequently draws boundaries. Um, we have uh, other uh, forms of communication uh, that are also high in openness. Uh, and uh, potentially uh, low uh, in their consideration of others. So let's look at a low in consideration of others and a low in openness of communication. And that's passive lose win. So in a passive lose win situation, someone may perceive that the other person is going to win in the conflict and that they are going to lose. And hence they just become passive to that response. They just sort of accept it. And uh, there is no conflict because the person who is uh, you know, receiving the injury in the conflict situation uh, just takes that injury and is passive. In the blue panel, immediately to the left of that, we see lose-lose communication. And this is uh, categorized by a passive-aggressive response uh, to conflict. Passive-aggressive response to conflict would be low in openness to communication and low in consideration uh, to others. Uh, and then finally, we have an aggressive approach to conflict, which is here in the top left-hand panel or in the green panel, and that's win-lose uh, conflict. And uh, we have a high openness of communication, but we have a very low consideration of others. Because we do not consider the other, we engage in aggressive communication 
that is not oriented towards resolving the conflict with the other. Again, win-lose conflict means that there's a winner and a loser. Uh, think about uh, a race. Uh, there's going to be one person who wins the race and everybody else who comes uh, behind them uh, will be a loser. Uh, if there's just going to be one loser, um, people who are, or I'm sorry, if there's just going to be one winner, people who are um, not winning, people who are losers in that situation, have an incentive uh, to pull the winner down. Win-win conflict. Win-win uh, conflict happens when both of us advance what we want and we're able to cooperate and communicate with one another so that I get a little bit of what I want, they get a little bit of what they want, and we both get some of what we both want. That's win-win communication. And obviously that's the, the best uh, outcome uh, for most conflict situations. Finally, we have lose-lose conflict, and uh, the graphic that I chose for that were, was two uh, individuals holding a gun to each other's head. Um, you can, of course, discharge your weapon and shoot the other person in the head. Uh, if you do so, they will surely discharge their weapon and shoot you in the head. And uh, the impact of that uh, is that neither one of us are able to achieve uh, our result uh, or our goal uh, without seriously harming ourselves. Uh, so in this situation, in order to get what you want, you have to hurt the other person, and both sides have an incentive to do that. Uh, a win-win would be uh, if both of them were able to de-escalate and walk away, and uh, both of them are able to get some of what they want. Next on this slide, we have different conflict resolution styles. I want to talk to you first about this competing style. Okay, Remember, that's uh, where the aggressive panel was. Uh, and we have assertive versus non-assertive. We have uncooperative versus cooperative. Uh, competing or domination is what's here in this top left panel. So if uh, we have a win-lose orientation, one of us is going to win, one of us is going to lose, we're competing. We're both trying not to take the L. Um, here under assertive uh, but cooperative, we have collaboration, and that's uh, where we integrate. That's where I tell you what I want, you tell me what you want. We work to lace those things together and cooperate so that we both get part of what we want. And uh, we both also don't get part of what we want, but we cooperate with one another. Uh, as opposed to a non-assertive and uncooperative uh, sort of uh, orientation, and that would be neglect or avoiding. Uh, so uh, if you engage in the exit response and you avoid the conflict altogether, or Somebody has sent you an email, but you decide you're not going to respond to that. That's avoiding the conflict. That's neglect. And then finally, uh, the last conflict resolution style that we'll discuss is accommodation. And that's appeasement. And that's where you kind of go along to get along. We're going to talk about the loyalty response uh, here in just a moment. That's a really good example of the loyalty response. Avoiding would be an example of the exit response. Uh, collaborating would be an example of the voice response. So you got a little bit of an insight into this in the previous slide. The exit response is where we refuse to talk. We um, maybe go for a walk. Um, we physically remove ourselves uh, from that area. The neglect response would be maybe we go for a walk and then when we get back, we say, hey, uh, I've calmed down and I don't want to talk about this. And uh, maybe we can discuss this again tomorrow. And then when tomorrow rolls around, you give another excuse for why you don't feel like talking about it. But ultimately, you just neglect coming back to the conflict. The loyalty response is where you place a greater emphasis on peace, and you place a greater emphasis on maintaining the relationship, and you place a greater emphasis on maintaining organizational uh, peace than you do on expressing your discontent. And uh, the loyalty response is also uh, potentially kind of bound up in potentially people-pleasing behavior, uh, where you kind of betray yourself to value the relationship. That's a loyalty response. Uh, and then finally, the voice response. Uh, the voice response is where you actively voice whatever it is that's bothering you. Uh, by engaging in the voice response, you allow others to engage in the voice response. And uh, if we're both engaged in the voice response and we both listen to each other, then we have the possibility to resolve the conflict amicably with a win-win solution if we both continue to listen to one another and uh, attend to each other. I thought this next uh, response was really interesting because it had uh, an emphasis on these three terms uh, that I heard a psychologist use recently, and uh, that was peace faking, peace making, and peace breaking. 
and uh, we have uh, essentially uh, those three kind of points on a continuum articulated in this slide. Peace faking is that appeasement. Uh, that's that loyalty uh, response. That's a, a potentially um, flight. That's denial uh, in extreme forms. Uh, that's a complete denial of self. And uh, you may wind up, you know, depressed and or suicidal uh, if you if you fake peace too much. Uh, I'm reminded by a wonderful quote uh, by the uh, famous actor Jim Carrey. Uh, Jim Carrey says depression is your brain telling you that it doesn't like the avatar that it's playing and uh, can't do it anymore. Uh, so inevitably, if you're engaged in a ton of peace faking, uh, you'll probably be, be depressed as a result of that. Uh, as, a pro, as opposed to peacemaking, peacemaking may uh, include, um, you've, you've brought this up with the other person, but now we're going to overlook it. Um, or maybe we're going to overlook it instead of bringing it up. Uh, the next one is discuss. Uh, the next one is negotiate. The next one's mediate. And the next one's arbitrate. And then obviously you can potentially appeal to uh, other folks who might have some authority to help you resolve that situation. Uh, if it's a romantic partner, uh, maybe, you know, that person's parents, maybe that person's uh, pastor, uh, you know, something of, of that nature. Uh, if it's a, a young person that you're engaged in a friendship with, uh, it may be, you know, that person, that person's friend, uh, maybe, you know, that person's uh, older brother, maybe uh, that person's boyfriend or girlfriend uh, might be, you know, someone that can help you reconcile and make peace with that other person. And then finally, we have peace breaking. And uh, peace breaking obviously uh, is, is, is a complete indifference uh, for the other person. And that's more kind of a win-lose conflict. And you're basically saying that you're going to win and the other person is going to lose. And that's uh, an inclination towards things like litigation. Uh, you're going to sue the other person uh, or uh, potentially maybe even assault uh, or, or violence. Inevitably, when we discuss conflict, people's trauma responses, in particular trauma responses uh, to traumas that may have happened when they were very young and uh, indeed uh, little children, uh, are, are certainly important. And uh, many of these uh, trauma responses uh, are things that are reinforced and uh, lots of interpersonal communicators uh, use these same trauma responses for years until they become aware of the pattern. The first uh, is um, fight. Uh, we have uh, flight, we have fawn, and we have freeze. Obviously, these are adrenaline responses uh, to trauma. Um, if you have adrenaline, um, then you are prepared uh, for fight. You get that big adrenaline burst. One of the things that adrenaline does is it prepares your limbs, it prepares your hands and your feet for physical excellence. Uh, so when you get a big burst of adrenaline, oftentimes you'll get you know, a lot of blood flow uh, in your hands. Uh, fight and flight uh, are both the same uh, with regard to that. Um, uh, ideally, you get the adrenaline flow and the blood flow in your hands uh, to engage in fighting and in your feet uh, to engage in flight. Um, in addition to that, you also have freeze and fawn. The original uh, response uh, to conflict or to you know a threat uh, was to freeze uh, because large megafauna predators like saber-toothed tigers have really poor eyesight. So uh, if you were uh, to just freeze and not move, uh, perhaps the, the predator wouldn't see you. Uh, sometimes uh, that's a trauma response uh, where people just kind of get stuck in relationships. And then finally, fawn. Fawn is a, a people-pleasing response uh, where you attempt to make the person who is, is hurting you uh, like you more uh, by attempting to please them better. And uh, fawn uh, is a people-pleasing, codependent uh, type of response uh, to conflict. We examined some potential trauma responses to conflict. Now let's look at some just generic, unproductive communication patterns during conflict. Uh, first, I want to talk about early stages, and then middle stages, and then later stages. Uh, first, in these early stages. Uh, we have a lot of communication in the conflict that fails to confirm individuals. Uh, we have cross-complaining, we have negative communication climate, we have mind reading, and we have a default towards criticism. Communication that fails to confirm the other individuals. Uh, so let's say, for instance, uh, you and your roommate are fighting about the dishes. 
uh, I all, one of your roommates says, uh, I feel like I always do the dishes. Well, communication fails to confirm individuals, right? So uh, maybe that's how that person feels, but maybe you feel like you, you do a pretty good job doing the dishes at least twice a week. Uh, your day to do the dishes, you know, formally is on Tuesday and your other day uh, to do them is on uh, Thursday. You know, you feel like you do a really good job doing the dishes on Tuesday and Thursday. There's a couple of days uh, where, you know, it's not assigned. You've got two days and then uh, your roommate uh, has two days and then you all have uh, three days that are, you know, everybody's supposed to be helping. And uh, you feel like you do a good job on your two days and uh, you don't feel like your roommate's statement has confirmed you. Well, that's probably going to start a conflict. The two of you will start cross complaining. Well, you know, what about on Tuesdays and Thursdays when I do the dishes? Well, I don't feel like you, you know, value my contribution. So now we're, we're in a negative uh, communication climate. And uh, if the two of us engage in a bunch of mind reading and uh, default to criticism, then that sets the stages for uh, the next stage in the conflict, which is the middle stage. And that's uh, where we have kitchen sinking. And that is um, where the fight now is no longer just about the dishes. Maybe now the fight is about um, who vacuums or who sweeps uh, or um, the fact that uh, laundry, you know, doesn't get done and uh, that the communal laundry uh, of the towels uh, is, is rarely done or that one person feels like they always do that. Uh, that leads to the two of us frequently interrupting uh, each other and not being respectful uh, of one another and of our uh, communication with each other, which leads to counter proposals. Uh, I'll do this, but you need to do that. And it leads to excessive miscommunication. So ultimately, these are unproductive communication patterns during conflict. So let's contrast that uh, with uh, potentially some, some productive communication. A productive uh, early stage in a conflict will confirm each other. I know that you've been doing a lot of dishes on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but it seems like we um, are, you know, really confused uh, about dishes on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Maybe we could explore a better distribution of, of labor uh, for these three unassigned dishes days. Uh, communication that foregrounds identity, relationship, status, and affection. Um, these are so important uh, when you're engaging in conflict. Uh, the uh, line, of course, that I'll always remember from my sister-in-law, uh, uh, Kim, is, do you want to be right or do you want to be in love? And uh, you've got to foreground uh, your identity and foreground the relationship status, foreground the fact that you have affection uh, for that other partner uh, when you're getting into the early stages of conflict. Uh, you may be right, but the, the end result of being right may be that you damage potentially your love uh, by um, being insistent that you're so right. And then finally, in early stages, a more constructive communication pattern is communication that fills the bucket first. Uh, so important. I value you. I value your contribution. You do a great job doing the dishes. I'm concerned about these three days where nobody's doing the dishes uh, because it seems like you know, you do a great job uh, two days a week, and then we're we're a mess. Um, you know, if it's not your two days and not my two days, you know, those other three days are just a mess. Uh, so communication that fills the bucket first and compliments the other person, makes the other person ready to receive uh, the, the, the conflict and makes the other person ready to attend to your emotions in the conflict. That's vitally important in the early stages. Next in the middle stages, communication that focuses on the main issues, uh, on building an agenda. Uh, bracketing, uh, saying, well, okay, yeah, uh, maybe we should talk about um, taking out the trash, and maybe we should talk about uh, floors and sweeping the floors, but let's figure out this, this conflict that we're having about the dishes first. Let's come back to that other thing if we need to. And then infrequent interruptions except for clarification. Maybe if you have a legitimate question, it's okay to interrupt the other person, but for the most part, value them, value their voice, allow them to speak, allow them to, to express themselves and share themselves without interruption. Recognize and acknowledge each other's perspective. This will be really, really important uh, to making sure that you've got a good resolution to the conflict. And if you've set the stage correctly in the early and the middle stages, then the later stages should be productive as well. You'll have communication that builds a successful resolution and a successful solution through negotiation and the acceptance of different 
uh, proposals from both sides. And then finally, communication that resets the relationship as more important than the conflict. I'm sorry we fought about the dishes and it makes me, you know, sad uh, that we had, you know, such bitter words about stupid inanimate objects, but I'm glad that we can work together to make healthy meals that are going to make more, both of us more uh, healthy and more productive. So if you have good later stage communication, uh, that's a, a certainty that the conflict was resolved correctly and appropriately. We have a really robust list of a lot of different communication patterns and a lot of different communication behaviors uh, on the slide. I'm just gonna talk about a few of them. Uh, again, constructive communication patterns validate each other. They're sensitive in terms of listening. They engage in that dual perspective. You don't interrupt the other person. You ask for some clarifications. You focus on main issues and you don't allow the conflict to, to uh, unnecessarily expand and widen. And you use muse, useful metacommunication. Useful metacommunication is communication about your communication. So uh, you have good communication about your communication. And then finally, positive affect. The two of you are smiling at one another. Um, you know, no one's frowning, no one's scowling, no one's uh, hovering over no one's, you know, attempting to physically intimidate you know, the other person. Both of you are engaged in good, positive affect. You're making good eye contact and you're smiling and you're val valuing each other. As opposed to unproductive uh, communication, uh, you disconfirm each other. Maybe you say some really mean things to each other. Maybe you invalidate uh, each, each other. Maybe you undercut uh, that other person, maybe you take a direct, you know, kind of knock uh, at, you know, their self-esteem. Maybe you have gunny sacked a whole lot of stuff. That's where you take all of these hurts and you stuff them in this little gunny sack. And now you're pulling all of these little hurts from the past out uh, during the middle of the conflict. Hey, uh, I'm still upset that you were five minutes late to pick me up at the airport, you know, three years ago. Um, you know, that caused me anxiety and stress. And, uh, you know, if you've got some stuff like that, all you need to do is throw in a little bit of hostile mind reading uh, where you're trying to finish the other person's uh, sentence, uh, some really excessive metacommunication where you're engaged in defensive listening. Well, what did you mean by that? Well, you know, uh, you know that, that's going to be really, really unproductive for your conflict. And then finally, uh, you've got a whole lot of negative affect uh, where the two of you maybe are frowning, maybe you're folding up your arms a little bit, maybe you're, you know, turned away from one another, uh, maybe you have, you know, some really um, negative nonverbal communication with each other. All of those things are going to contribute to an unproductive communication climate, uh, which we talked about in Chapter 8, and that's going to lead to additional unproductive conflict. Our last main point has to do with conflict management skills, and you're going to want to attend to the relationship level uh, of meaning uh, in uh, your conflict. In other words, prioritize the relationship. Remember who you're, you're having a conflict with. Remember that you only have one mother. You only have one husband or wife. Um, you only have uh, a few uh, sons or daughters. Uh, you only have one best friend. Um, you would be sad if you were engaged in uh, a vicious conflict with your only best friend and uh, you said some really mean things to them uh, that caused the two of you to not be best friends anymore. Uh, that's something that you would regret for the rest of your life. Uh, so attend to that relationship level meaning and understand who it is that you're communicating with and who it is that you're conflicting with. Next, communicate supportively. Make eye contact with the other person. Encourage them to elaborate. Encourage them to share more of their feelings. Listen mindfully. Uh, sometimes that can be painful. Uh, especially uh, when another person is asking us to be accountable uh, for actions that hurt them. Uh, conversely, that accountability uh, and listening mindfully uh, may be the only thing uh, that can repair your damaged relationship. Uh, fourth, own your feelings and your thoughts and your issues. You remember in chapter four, we talked about I language versus you language and how important it is to use I statements during conflicts. Remember, you language or pointing your finger, whether it's rhetorically or physically, puts the other person on the defensive. And you see how uncomfortable it is for me to point my finger at you here uh, on the recording. So own your own feelings, your thoughts, and your issues. Try not to make that other person defensive by using a whole lot of you language. Use I language instead. 
That will help you better manage the conflict. Next, check your perceptions and make sure that you are perceiving the situation accurately. It may be helpful to ask other people about your perceptions. Share with them uh, the same data that you're processing and confirm that your perception of the situation is indeed accurate. Perhaps ask the other person that you're engaged in the conflict with some questions. Well, what was your motivation? Why did you behave that way? It may be that it wasn't about you. Uh, it may uh, be a, a big misunderstanding. Look for points of agreement. And if you're engaged in that subtle questioning uh, type of process, that's going to give you an opportunity to find those points of agreement. Look for ways to preserve the other's face. Um, I'm sure you just forgot about this. I know that you didn't do that intentionally. Uh, uh, it's a good example of allowing the other person to preserve face. This is a gigantic construct uh, in uh, Japanese culture. And uh, if you're engaged in uh, some international business uh, in Japan, uh, face saving and uh, preserving uh, the face is a, is a good thing for you to become more familiar with. And then finally on this slide, imagine how you'll feel in the future. Uh, let's say that you say what you're thinking about saying and you win the argument and the other person complies. Uh, is that gonna value your relationship? Is that person gonna wanna uh, go out to lunch with you next week uh, after you say uh, all of the things that you want to say uh, to them? Uh, or um, are, are you going to have damaged that relationship beyond repair uh, based on your demand to be right uh, as opposed to be in a relationship. In this short conflict video, we defined conflict. We looked at some principles and causes of conflict. We looked at some different outcomes and responses to conflict. And finally, we looked at conflict resolution and some ways uh, that you can resolve conflicts. I'll conclude with some tips for more effectively managing conflict. Uh, I think that this, uh, this picture is interesting. Uh, we see two children uh, fighting uh, over a book, and uh, it's, it's not really uh, that, uh, I would say, advanced uh, of a conflict. We have two uh, children fighting over a perceived scarce resource. We have one person you know, trying to hold on and screaming mine, and the other person trying to wrench it from them. Unfortunately, a lot of conflict in relationships and a lot of conflict at work looks like this. And uh, the reason for that is because we ignore some of the lessons on the next slide. Remember, conflict is inevitable and can be productive. In order to manage it correctly and well, you should try to have good, effective communication during conflicts. Remember to focus on the overall communication system. Make sure that you're talking about your feelings. Make sure that you're talking about the words that are being said. Make sure that you're focused on the communication. Time the conflict purposefully. Uh, no one wants to fight first thing in the morning. Uh, no one wants to fight right after they get off work. Time the conflict uh, so that it can be done uh, in, a, in a purposeful way and so that you'll have enough time to, to fully engage in the conflict and have a, a productive outcome. Remember, productive outcomes and win-win uh, resolutions to conflict take time. You have to listen to the other person. You have to process what they're saying. You have to compromise. You have to float that compromise out there. The two of you have to massage that compromise. And ultimately, the two of you have to agree on something. Aim for win-win conflict, but remember it takes time. Honor yourself and your partner and the relationship. You don't want to say really horrible negative things uh, in an effort to win the conflict uh, and then damage the relationship. Uh, you may be such an effective uh, arguer uh, that you uh, have the rest of your life uh, to reflect on, on how well you won that argument. Uh, honor yourself, honor your partner, and honor your relationship. And then finally, show grace when it's appropriate. Uh, if the other person, uh, if you call the other person out on something and uh, they, uh, they, uh, they say, wow, I hadn't thought about it from that perspective, and that's, that's you know, awful. Uh, I'll do better in the future. You know, please forgive me. Um, if uh, you do get, you know, that amazing apology, that is not the appropriate time uh, to uh, kind of beat up on that other person and, uh, you know, plumb the depths of how they made you feel uh, and, you know, get into it uh, over and over and over again. That's not going to de-escalate the conflict. Uh, you've, uh, you've brought your concern to the other person. The other person has heard you. They've agreed uh, with your perspective, and now they're, they're going to attempt to make restitution and make it right. 
and that is uh, the appropriate time for you to show grace. Uh, and if you show grace, and uh, if that other person follows through on what they're supposed to do to resolve and uh, to, to repair uh, that relationship uh, and resolve that conflict, then you should be well on your way to resolving the conflict successfully. But at the end of a conflict, uh, oftentimes when there is agreement, uh, one and or both parties must demonstrate some grace to one another uh, to fully de-escalate the conflict. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate your, your time and your effort. I think if you'll pay uh, attention to these recommendations, you should more effectively manage conflict in the future.